Uh, this is the first part of lecture 12 on RF location sensing. Lecture 12 is the second lecture in the lecture series that we refer to as part 4, uh, system aspects. And uh, the objective of this lecture series was to provide the, uh, some of the latest developments in uh, uh, location aware uh, broadband ad hoc sensor networks and uh, at the same time uh, show some significance of the application of channel modeling and uh, modern design technology or techniques that we studied in part two and three of the lecture series. Uh, this particular lecture uh, I will start with an introduction then I talk about uh, RF location sensing techniques. Then I talk about modeling of the behavior of the sensors. And at the end, I talk a little bit about uh, positioning algorithms. To start the lecture, uh, basically, uh, a location sensing uh, system or RF location system, uh, sensing system consists of uh, three elements. One is like a location sensor or location sensing device uh, which is receiving some RF signal which can come from some place or from a tag and uh, from that received signal it extracts something that we call the matrix which could be angle of arrival of the receive signal, time of arrival of the receive signal, or the receive signal strength. And then we have a bunch of these sensors. They report these matrices to a positioning algorithm, and positioning algorithm tells you where is the location of the object. And then we have a display system in many cases which just shows the map of the area and shows the location of the person inside that area. Uh, our emphasis is on these two parts, location sensing, uh, sensors and matrices, and how accurate we can do the sen uh, positioning based on this thing, and also a little bit about algorithms which are used for location sensing. Now why location sensing became important? Actually, uh, originally uh, with the FCC E911 mandate, uh, which was supposed to be implemented by year, I believe originally 2001, then they stretched it up to now. And uh, the issue was that if somebody has like a cell phone, you can locate the person within like 125 meter of accuracy. Now, the independent location sensing, in fact, was existing one is GPS. But GPS is an independent network. These guys are like overlay on the existing networks, wireless technology. That was like one of the mandates and one of the uh, like interest uh, sources of interest for using location sensing for outdoor. Now, who is interested in that? It's not only like FCC mandate. Now, if you have no location of a terminal, you can develop a new trend of services, which is location sensitive services. So when you are getting close to a shopping mall, uh, people can send you advertisement in your like notepad that there are like uh, sales in particular places. Or uh, uh, you go to downtown area of a city, it shows you like uh, where are the hotels <coughs> close by. And possibly you go inside like a building, they show you like inside of a, uh, let's say, uh, art gallery, you go in front of the material and 
in front of the art piece of art and it starts to tell you what is related to that so applications really which are location sensitive are evolving this is one trend of applications then there are other trend of applications always incentive for an industry is application really the other center of other part of this type of thing is that people are thinking about like uh, tagging uh, commercial in warehouses like so these ships are coming uh, in the port and they drop tons of like merchandise which are small boxes and then later on you want to go and find them a specific ones you want to tag them that's one beautiful application the other one is that like uh, you go to Disneyland and you're always worried that you may lose your children they tag the children there are other applications like in the houses for elderly like these elderly one of the problems is that sometimes they need emergency help and if there's something wrong with them you want to detect them where they are you go inside the hospitals they have equipments that they are frequently used and people carry them and they leave them and then they cannot find them around this type of applications then a bunch of companies are developing applications then uh, these are location sensitive applications then you are like the one that everybody have seen is inside the cars you have these direction finders inside the cars the existing technology is GPS and GPS if you want it has its own uh, infrastructure but uh, when it comes inside the building and in urban areas it doesn't work okay that's one of the problem the other problem the other problem is that you need a GPS receiver anyways so another industry is evolving in there and that industry is really two part one part is uh, uh, positioning of the people outside the building in the urban areas the other one is positioning them inside the building two separate industries and we refer to both of them together as RF location sensing industry if you want to call them it's one of the growing industries recent industries and it's also interesting because it has a lot of like basic questions that needs to be answered and in the rest of this lecture I'm talking about those basic questions that needs to be answered now the technology by itself also has an added value that has an impact in the way that we live so you can imagine that the fancy ones in the future if somebody is blind really with this accurate location sensing you can give them a sense of having eyes to walk where they are inside the building directing them and uh, so there are a lot of actual potential applications evolving this area is like wireless lands for example 20 years ago people had a wild imagination of tons of applications for this type of thing and today's part of them are forming which are not the same thing that we were thinking at the beginning but they are forming a solid industry positioning is like that but this is early stages of positioning in particular indoor positioning and now positioning indoor positioning is more challenging than outdoor positioning because in indoor we have more multi and I will explain why these things are important what are the research and technologies which are evolving around that in the next I mean in this particular lecture so in order to study that we have number one we have to see what are the alternatives which I told you there are like time of arrival anger of arrival receive signal strength these are the ones that you can measure and then you have positioning algorithm which are processing these signals and they want to find the accuracy of them now 
So I need to know the behavior of time of arrival, angle of arrival, receive signals and systems in order to know how to design the algorithms and what and to examine the algorithms, the accuracy of the algorithms. Now, so what I do is that first I start to talk about location sensing techniques, time of arrival base, and receive signal strength, and angle of arrival base, very shortly in the first part. The most popular one is time of arrival based systems and variety of technologies is used in them. What is the meaning of time of arrival base? Basically, in time of arrival base, I want to, I have, we have seen that in chapter three or whatever, I have a signal coming from one point to another point. This is my sensor and this is my device, whatever it is, and there's the distance D. If I can somehow evaluate like the delay tau, which is between these two, the time of fly between the two, then I can calculate the distance from like tau times velocity of light. Hmm? That's, that's how I can calculate this distance. If I know the distance of this guy from the destination, then I have variety of algorithms. If I have several sensors, I have variety of algorithms to find the location of this person. So that's the whole area. Those algorithms which are crunching this distance are called like, I call them, I treat them separately, and then techniques to measure this distance or have an indication of the distance are techniques that I will study first and to see how they put it together. First thing is that if I want to have, a, have an idea about where is the location of this guy, the easiest one is calculate the time of arrival, okay, TOA systems, or estimate the TOA, okay. Now, I can estimate the TOA by using either a narrow band signal or a wide band signal or an ultra wide band signal or other techniques. So I start with narrow band signals and time of arrival estimation. In narrow band signaling, I will send like a signal like this, which is a cosine, and then at the receiver I receive another cosine like this. If I cross correlate this, if I have a reference of the transmitted signal, I cross correlate them together, and from this delay between the two, I can calculate the distance between the transmitter and receiver. Hmm? So I send a cosine, I receive another cosine with a different phase. If I calculate that phase, I know the delay between the transmitter and receiver. And if I know the delay between transmitter and receiver, I can calculate the distance between transmitter and receiver. This is a very accurate one, actually. And they use this thing for in, like, one of the means for GPS. Accurate GPS is calculation of the phase. So phase is very popular, very good for GPS. But when you come to urban areas and for indoor areas, it has some difficulties. The difficulty is that when I have multipath, when I send a cosine and I receive a cosine and I have only one path, the difference between phase of these two is the f related to the distance. But if I have multipath, I have like one, one path in here, one path in here, one path in here, one path in here. When I add them up, this phase is not the phase of direct path. See, when I have two a transmitter and receiver, I'm interested in this direct path. If something is bounced in here, I'm not interested in the phase of that. And when these two are added together, I get anyways with narrow band only one phase, which is phase of this plus phase of this. So in a multipath environment, 
phase estimation is not a good technique. Okay? And if I have like two paths, I can do some tricks and say I have two paths and then uh, I measure like two points, for example, and I solve. I solve and I find phi 1 and phi 2. That's a possibility, but it's a very challenging thing. So, that's the first thing, face technique. Face techniques, actually, people have used it for like, if you want to do like, find a golf ball inside a golf course. That's actually one of the popular applications that people are interested in for like this local positioning, if you want to call it. So you want to estimate the distance between something and another one. It could be useful. Now, another technique which is very popular and the dominant one for estimation of time of arrival is uh, basically... Uh, we call it um, time of arrival wide band wide band time of arrival TOA techniques for wide, for wide band TDO time wide band time of arrival estimation techniques uh, you send a pulse a wide pulse I mean, if your bandwidth is wide, and this one is narrow enough, you have multi-path, you say, receive different paths. But if you take the delay between this one and the transmitted path, this delay, this is your direct path. And this delay gives you the distance. And the other paths are not going to create problem. So time of arrival, original GPS is a time of arrival estimation technique which uses both time of arrival from delay ta and time of arrival from phase phi. Phi is not useful for us if we have multipath, but this ta is still useful for us. Now, uh, then what is the problem? If I have like a channel impulse response like this, the actual channel impulse response, if I send like how what is how wide is my bandwidth if my bandwidth is 100 megahertz I'm combining some of these paths if I my bandwidth is like 10 megahertz I combine a bunch of these paths because the base of the pulse is inverse of the bandwidth so as I increase my bandwidth my pulse gets narrower and I get closer to the first one. So I have a more accurate system. Okay. Now, so if I'm sending something like this, for example, these are the pulses which are received, for example. There are algorithms called super resolution algorithms which make this refine. They use a spectral estimation technique. They make it refine like that. So that's one technique. One technique to make the estimation of time of arrival better is the so-called super resolution technique, which actually uses signal processing to resolve more paths which are already combined together to form the step. This is called super resolution algorithm. Actually, one of my last PhD student was working in this area, and he finished last year. Jin Rang Lee. Now he's a professor in the University of Texas. Now, uh, what he did, he used applied super resolution algorithms to create this particular curve that I'm showing you. Actually, it is generated by him. And uh, okay, this particular curve. And then the advantage of these super resolution algorithms are that they really decompose the paths which have created a multi path combination. Okay. So, really, they virtually 
increase your bandwidth. <coughs> so you send pulses which are like 100 nanosecond width. This resolves it so that it looks like pulses are 10 nanosecond width or less than that. That's, so, so this is one thing that you want to know. It's applicable. People are studying these things. They're right now on their evaluation. So that's one line of research and one line of area. Why people do that? Because they want to improve the position. What will happen? See, I had the first path really expected to arrive in here. But since my bandwidth was higher, it has, I mean, paths have been combined and the peak has been shifted to here. So rather than is expecting, and rather than estimating my peak in here, I have estimated in here, so I make so much delay error. And delay every three nanoseconds is what? Equivalent to one meter error in the distance. I'm talking about indoor areas. If I make 10 nanosecond error, if my peak goes 10 nanoseconds, I make three meter errors. Okay? So now if I have super resolution, super resolution will refine these pulses and actually get more accurate position of the first. So this is one of my major problems in time of arrival estimation, which is the dominant technique for estimation of time of arrival. Estimation of the distance, accurate estimation of distance. Another so super resolution is good, it's complex, and it's improving my thing. Another way to improve the uh, estimation of time of arrival is to use ultra wideband. If I use ultra wideband, I have many paths, and they don't even get combined. So I can accurately measure the first path. But the problem in here is that I accurately message, message but this first path is very weak. One problem that this time of arrival estimation techniques suffer from is that sometimes this guy gets so weak that we cannot detect it, detect the first path. If you cannot detect the first path, then you make substantially large errors. So I have two sources of creating error. One is that these are, there are a bunch of these paths close to one another that they combine and shift the peak. The other one is that first path get buried. Okay. Actually, my group in WPI was one of the first group that started to study these things for the indoor radio communication. Now, uh, if I resort to ultra wideband, when, when I resort, when I increase my bandwidth, as I start to increase my bandwidth, the location of this peak, which is uh, location of these peaks, location of these peaks, as I increase my bandwidth shift in the location of the peak, which is my error, is reduced. This peak gets closer to this as I'm increasing my bandwidth. But at the same time, I'm resolving more and more paths. So a strength of the first path comes lower. So necessarily, if we increase the bandwidth to ultra wide band, does not mean that on the average I have better accuracy. This is something very recently found, okay? Because it was a very confusing area before. Now, the next thing is the source of error. One are these paths which are, if you want to say, paths which are close to first path. The other one is the time that path dies, first path dies. When first path dies, we make major errors, big errors, okay? This is like two things related. Now, this figure is defining the so-called undetected direct path. This is not, this is not the same UDP as 
the way that it's used in internet. This is undetected direct path. Okay. Now, undetected direct path. These are the paths in here, which are coming from ray tracing, and this plot is generated by Bal. The one of actually your uh, TA of this course. So listen very carefully because he's grading your homeworks. Now, that's uh, the bandwidth is 200 megahertz, and these paths get combined. Look at like these paths, for example, four or five paths have combined to one path. Okay. If I have like all of these things, really, the ray tracing result assumes bandwidth is infinity. Because each pulse is only one pulse. But as soon as I do this, I'm combining these guys together. When I combine them, amplitude gets stronger, actually, and better. And then, whenever that first path is under a threshold, I have to always, in telecommunication, put a threshold, because there is noise level in there. I have to differentiate signal to noise. So when I go under the noise, and first path goes under the noise, I call it undetected direct path. And when this guy goes under, now I take this next one as the first one, so I make substantially large errors. Okay, and that's what we want to cure. And everybody is doing research now around this issue. That when the first path dies, how you can survive. Okay. Who is interested in that for indoor positioning to have this type of thing? DARPA. DARPA is extremely interested in that because they are working on the so-called urban fighting scenarios in which you are assuming that certain elements are inside the building that you want to locate them. And also these elements could be elements which are not desired elements or it could be like elements that they are desirable. So my own soldier and the enemy's soldier. But I want to locate them inside the building. Other applications like firefighters are going inside. Accuracy becomes very important. But if I have like application like somebody approaches like a mall and I want to tell the guy that there is a like sale somewhere, I don't need that much of accuracy. So in this area, we have a lot of applications which are evolving. Some of the applications are only for location and identity. Some are for accurate location. Science is around accurate location. And that's what we are working on. Now, so this is where we, where we are. So there are three parameters in here. One parameter is the bandwidth. Huh? And then I have like multipath structure, multipath structure, and then I have this issue of undetected direct path. These three are somehow intertwined to create a very complex phenomenon in there. If you want to see some examples from things that I was telling you, I want to look at undetected direct path in ultra-wide band. We have two measurements in here. These measurements are done actually by Jin Ron. And what he did, he did the measurement with three gigahertz bandwidth and he takes a, he has a profile like this. This is the profile with three gigahertz bandwidth. Now, then uh, he enforces a pulse with 500 megahertz bandwidth. So equivalent of this measurement at 3 gigahertz is this measurement with 500 megahertz. Why 3 gigahertz? 1, 500, 5, you remember that. Ultra wide band, multi band OFDM was what? 500 megahertz bandwidth. And the other one was like 2 gigahertz. And then the other one was 5 gigahertz. So this 3 gigahertz are other technologies. Look at this. This is my threshold. This is his threshold, actually. This is the threshold in here. Okay? And this is the first path. 
I mean in here the first path is buried. Here the first path is in here. It still is buried. Now you look at the other paths. The next path in here is under the threshold. The next path is under pressure. So I will detect this one, which associate to so much of error. But when I go to 500 megahertz, these guys are combining and they are coming above the threshold. So my error in here is less than the error in here. Did you follow? So the message from here is that the general concept that everybody had in the past like 10 years or whatever, that if I increase the bandwidth, I have more accuracy, is incorrect. Okay, bandwidth goes up to certain time. More than that, actually, it will damage you because it increases the probability of undetected direct path. And this is something that I was repeating in lecture 11 and here several times because that's a, one of the findings of our lab battery, recent finding. So I think I told you enough about time of arrival based systems. Basically, in the industry today, we have two types of popular technologies. One is the time of arrival based systems, which is used by military and by commerce, both of them. And they are using, it's under investigation still, and also under application. The other set of systems are the systems which are receive signal strength. Receive signal strength is apparently much simpler than time of arrival. Because in order to measure the time of arrival, I have to process the signal. I have to have wide band. Receive signals, I don't need anything. I can measure the power wherever. OK? Now, people who are in receive signal strength, there are a bunch of them. People in time of arrival, they are emerging. These are for accurate. These are less accurate. Less accurate. Okay. Let's see that how does this receive signal strength people. If I want to take the distance, I have to think about the behavior of this thing. Receive signal strength is what? Is a random variable. It has Rayleigh fading and it has shadow fading. I can average it. If I average I take away the Rayleigh fading, but how can I take care of the shadow fading? So it stays there. So if I take the receive signal strength, always I have problem for measuring distance. But it's easy to measure. And I don't need to know anything about a specification of the signal, nothing I can do. Now, these are like some results that actually you have Pekka, which is the TA now in Finland, he did in their laboratory in Finland, CWC laboratory. These are the receive signal strength. We have three wireless lands. Actually, we have four wireless lands. And then he receives, these are the receive signal strength associated to those four wireless lands. When you're walking from one place to the other place. These powers are going up and down. I mean, as the distance increases, in general, I see the pattern that some of them, they go down, and some of them, they come up. But prediction of these patterns are not as simple. A group of companies, however, have emerged around this. One of the most popular one is Ekahao, which is in Helsinki. There are some local ones in the Massachusetts, like Pango and uh, Newberry, Newberry uh, Nets, I believe, Networks, something. But all of them are using these technologies. The way that they use is that inside the laptop, you put a software. And what you do is that you first walk inside a building, and in several pl places, you tune your algorithm. And then next time when you're walking in here, the software gives you the location. Okay? That's, but 
what they do they are using receive signal strength as a measure or as the matrix we can use angle of arrival angle of arrival for indoor areas is very difficult but angle of arrival was considered for outdoor areas for angle of arrival if I have like a directional antenna which measures anything hover within this angle so I know that somebody is in this angle in this uh, like base station I know somebody is in this angle at this base station so the tag should be somewhere in here this is one of the technologies which is used for E911 but for indoor it's not good because I mean in indoor areas the base stations or access points are small and as of now directional antennas are not used there but for cellular systems all of them they have sectored antennas three sectored antennas at least and you can get more in there if you want so that was the first part of indoor positioning stuff but I told you I introduced you to three techniques I introduced you to time of arrival based techniques and I introduced you to angle of arrival based and receive signal strength based systems now about the behavior of this thing now angle of arrival is not very popular I will drop it now and I stick to the two receive signal strength and time of arrival receive signal strength for the behavior I already told you the behavior of receive signal strength is exactly what we were studying before it has multipath fading it has shadow fading as a result, I cannot get a good estimate of the distance. Because always, if I want to calculate the distance, I end up with what? I end up with equations for path loss, for example, that like path loss LP equals to L0 plus half log 10 of distance plus something like eta, for example. This is like my shadow fading shadow fading so this one creates some problem the other one is that this alpha is not fixed alpha I calculated statistically it's different in different buildings but still I mean we have good numbers so this one is good but because of that I don't have very accurate things actually uh, one of my PhD students Hatami currently is working on taking advantage of these things to improve the existing models for the estimation of the location so it's another area of research that people are involved in that uh, the technology which evolved in Ekahao one of the student of Henry Terry one of the professors of University of Helsinki has published some papers in there so this is a very good area of research for those who want to work in this area to develop algorithms based on receive signal strength or time of arrival base either very good areas of research now the area of research uh, that uh, we are involved with in, in my laboratory and my student we are mostly interested in like time of arrival based systems though I have two graduate students also on receive signal strength based system and now you notice that my lectures are going more toward re research which is the end of the course that was a good news <laughs> in a sense uh, now for time of arrival based systems uh, basically there is an opening there is no channel model no existing channel model at least there was none earlier and why there is no channel model why we cannot use channel models for communication for the positioning application because channel models for communication like GSM model like SOLES model whatever they are modeling multipath like this so that RMS delay spread fits the measurement they pay no attention to the arrival of the first path 
So this model for positioning, I want to know what is the statistics of arrival of the first path and how much it goes back and forth in here. And this issue has not been addressed in any of the, I mean, Sala Valenzuela or GSM or any model. So I have to create something which is new. So this is an open area here. Now the question comes that now if I use like let's say the popular Sala Valenzuela's model for distance measurement error in indoor areas, what will happen? These are some results that one of my PhD students, actually Bardia has created. And uh, for 500 megahertz bandwidth and 3 gigahertz bandwidth. These are results of Sala Valenzuela's for distance measurement error. And these are results from measurements. They are sharply apart. Okay. So basically existing models like Sala Valenzuela's model are not answering the uh, they are not suitable for characteristics of measurement error based on time of arrival. And there is a need for development of better models. Now, one of the early models in that line which was developed is this two-path model which was developed by, uh, by uh, Prashant, one of my uh, PhD students who is currently a professor at University of Pittsburgh and in this model he developed a two path model in which the delay spread fits the TAR MS and also undetected direct path occurrence is included in it Okay, and these are the result of ray tracing and simulation model for that. He assumes infinite bandwidth using ray tracing. This model was developed 1998 under SOSAS project, which is a DARPA project, and to my knowledge is the first model, which is addressing this particular issue, relates the multipath to uh, probability of having undetected direct path, which is the main problem for time of arrival estimation. Later on, uh, as I told you, there are two causes of error if my bandwidth is not infinity. If bandwidth is infinity, only undetected direct path is a source, and this model developed by Prashant is one model that can be used but in practice bandwidth is less than infinity what is the effect of bandwidth on the general occurrence of time of arrival estimation error this issue actually number one as I told you earlier is caused by two things one is that I have these paths close to the direct path the other one is that the time that I cannot detect the direct path so now we need to develop a model for that. This model is a part of actually thesis of Bardia, your TA, uh, and he has generated some results and he is still working on that. This is the analysis of the situation that what will happen. This is expected time of arrival. I have these paths next to the direct path. They shift the peak actually to the negative direction. And so what is the effect of this bandwidth, which is the width of the pulse, on this error, distance measure element error that we have? And to answer that, Bardia developed in, 19, in 2003, developed two models for line of sight, 100 megahertz bandwidth, 100 megahertz, that's for the example. And he fitted for line of sight, obstructed line of sight and line of sight, the error which are measured and the errors which are simulated. So he developed actually the first model for estimation of distance 
measurement error. This model is cited with other people or using that. Now, who needs that type of model? People who want to develop algorithms. If you want to develop algorithms for positioning, if you don't have any model that how error is occurring, you're lost. You don't have any reference to improve your model. So this model is used right now uh, by another mod, another PhD student of mine, and also there is another group, Pulsar group in like uh, France, and many other people to develop algorithms and improve the algorithm. But what is the model? How he has done the modeling? Basically, he develops a statistic. He does a bunch of measurement, or he uses ray tracing, and he models the distance measurement error, the two components of it. One component is the component which is caused by lack of infinite bandwidth. The other one is the component which is caused by undetected direct path. First path goes under the threshold. And these are some good results of his work, which is uh, good well cited. So that's about uh, uh, two things. What I told you, one was I told you about different technologies. Uh, and I told you that receive signal strength based and time of arrival based uh, indoor positioning systems are the two popular systems. And then what I told you was that behavior of uh, receive signal strength is, we know that from what we saw in chapter four, but behavior of time of arrival we don't know, and this is an issue which is right now under research. And we need that because we want to develop algorithms. And now I want to talk a little bit about these algorithms. What are the type of algorithms? And that would be the last part. The type of algorithms that people are using are two types. One is like I have, let's say, three, four base stations. And then I have a mobile terminal in here. Mobile terminal has an estimate of this distance, estimate of this distance, estimate D1, D2, D3 hat and D4 hat. He has all of these estimates and he wants to find the location of this guy. If I know these things, I can develop some circles around and then hopefully the area between all of the circles is the location of the mobile. Somewhere in there. That's how we do it. Now, then uh, these algorithms, either they are like least square algorithms or like uh, maximum likelihood algorithms. There are two type of algorithms in there, basically. I'm just giving you a survey in here. And then you want to compare their performance. So what you do is that you take these four base station and you create a grid in between, a very dense grid. And in each location of these grids, you assume that mobile is in there, and then you use something like Pardio's model to know what is this D hat, and then you run your algorithm. With the algorithm, you come to estimate like this, measure this error. Okay? So now then you can compare one algorithm with another algorithm. Okay? And that's what they are doing right now. So they are developing model for the pattern of error and model for, uh, and, uh, and also performance variation of different algorithms based on the models. Okay. Now, these are actually work of Modafar, one of my PhD students, some of the works, two type of algorithm. I mean, I don't want to go to the detail. This one is a, is a maximum likelihood type algorithm. And then he has two types of least square algorithm, for example. And he goes inside the building. He puts four base stations in here. 
and then he creates a grid in here and in this grid he creates reference points for maximum likelihood estimation now if you create these reference points this is the density of the grid in here is one meter one meter in here is 10 meter okay so anyways for maximum likelihood estimation type of technique size of this grid is always important okay this is the size of the grid least the squares are independent of the size of grid and then he compares them okay so there are two sets of algorithms least square and maximum likelihood maximum likelihood is dependent on a grid this is not and he wants to see how the accuracy of these things are related if you have a model he uses actually Bardio's model and he generates results like that and then he says this algorithm is better than the other algorithm who is interested in this type of result DARPA why they are interested in that, this type of result because they want to locate the soldiers inside the building and the more accurate it is the better it is before knowing the model and the behavior of the channel it was impossible to design and improve so it's a very good example of system engineering if you don't know the channel and behavior of the channel whatever you are talking about is like talking in the blindness I mean you don't know you have different time they have this famous story of elephant in the darkness room is a story huh? so each person nobody sees it There's some one person touches the foot and says that elephant is like a column the other one touches the ivory says that it's like a rock the other one <laughs> gets the trunk and says that is very soft so the first thing need for channel modeling is to turn the light on when the turn you turn the light on now you see the whole picture and then also you can compare the techniques with one another when you see the whole picture then you know what you're talking about okay so that's one of the importance of channel modeling Channel modeling, however, was not taking as much of attention before because wireless channel was not challenged as much. People were not going to high data rates and they were not keen on positioning. As you get more keen in positioning and you're more keen to, pro to go to higher data rates, multipath becomes to the picture, comes to the picture, and you cannot ignore it anymore. Okay? and then understanding of that then sheds light to go for the next step so you come to like ultra wideband or MIMO like uh, 802.11 uh, I mean uh, 11N for the MIMO they have a channel modeling group going in parallel because they want to go to higher data rate ultra wideband they have a channel modeling group to go in parallel but you go to original 802.11 nobody was caring about that because they were not beating the channel to death they wanted only to have something to work 2 megabit per second only but in 802.11n they want 100 megabit per second so if you don't know the channel you cannot do that Okay, so that's why we were studying and putting so much emphasis on channel modeling and then in this last lecture, I was trying to, to show you that the importance of that, of the channel modeling, for the next, in fact, round. Next round is location awareness. Okay? Again, if you don't know the channel modeling, you can do any of these things. Now, people who were working in positioning, like GPS, GPS is a satellite, one line, one path channel. is no multipath. So they were only de defining variety of algorithms for performance of time of arrival based systems in non multi path environment. At most recently they were talking about like two paths, for example. But we are talking about indoor areas which are hundreds of paths. So understanding of the channel will open the future for that line of research. And that's why 
at least my group is doing that one that part of research this is now again one example about some place that channel modeling is not important that much algorithms but receive signal strength based things these are the work that uh, Hatami, one of my students actually has done recently that's his PhD thesis is working on that so you have a bunch of uh, like access points and you walk in the building this is the first floor of Atwater Kent laboratory and you apply different algorithms and you see that these different algorithms how they compare with one another now how to generate all of these points in there he uses ray tracing algorithm these are some of these, these results which are comparing different scenarios for different like parameters or for different algorithms and in there these are distance measurement accuracy and this is probability of like making that particular error so basically in here now channel models he is using the channel models basically to uh, simulate the environment okay but these channel models that he has are power based channel models and what were the channel models that we had earlier one was like like this uh, two piece or three piece channels distance partition distance models like a dot 11 model and the other one was like ray tracing he uses both of them and compares different algorithms based on those things. And this is another PhD thesis, which is emerging. Now, and then what they do is that based on the channel model, they can compare the performance of different algorithms with or different parameters in the algorithms. So with that, I would like to close this and summarize what I was talking about in uh, RF positioning systems. In general, I talked about the importance and applications of RF positioning systems. Then I came uh, and I told you that's an emerging area and there are a lot of people working on that currently. And among the problems which exist, one is model for, uh, for the uh, multipath structure and its relationship to uh, different algorithms. And uh, in between, I told you this is an example of system example in which lack of knowledge about behavior of the channel uh, provides a blind environment for development, for progress. We have a toolbox full of algorithms which have evolved for uh, GPS systems. And when we want to apply them for the indoor, for example, it's useless because we cannot compare them. What we need is we have to understand the channel. So radio communication, as I told you perhaps in my first lecture, some people, they say, uh, wireless communication is uh, is application and propagation and that was why that I was putting so much of emphasis on propagation when I started this area of research I had some of our colleagues that they were surprised that while everybody is working on internet we are doing measurements of the channel and modeling but as time passed, passed by we find out that yes actually people have more and more need to channel modeling for understanding of wireless network. And channel modeling is the core for development of the next generation technology. And with that, I will close this discussion if you don't have any questions.